Today we're moving on uh, to a chapter that many students in past semesters have said is their favorite in the reader, which is the chapter by Philip Zimbardo. Philip Zimbardo is interesting and fun for two reasons. First of all, he writes not about being good, but about, about being bad, and often that is closer to a, many students' natural inclination because we, can, we know that good habits and bad habits are the result of training, but often bad habits are so much more fun. Uh, so bad things are often considered more interesting, more exciting. Uh, but Philip Zimbardo himself is also a very interesting person, a very colorful person. He, he's often referred to as Dr. Evil, and he dresses up to look that way. He has a goatee, and he looks like a, the devil, right? He does that on purpose. Uh, interestingly enough, he's now in his 80s. He's focused or dedicated the last part of his life to actually doing the opposite, to being a champion of ethical heroism. He, he discovered in his research, and his research is empirical, as is the case of a lot of the other authors we've studied, who, who established the concept of studying ethics empirically? Kohlberg. Kohlberg is known for making that sort of a uh, accepted uh, assumption that we can either use a normative or an empirical approach. And today, no one would argue that the empirical approach is not legitimate. And so what both Stanley Milgram and Philip Zimbardo did was to show how easy it is to manipulate people in a, in, in a given context, people who you would consider to be good people and people who consider themselves to be good people, to get them to do things that they themselves would consider to be evil because of the pressure, because of the uh, situational factors as, uh, as a term that Zimbardo coins. What he also discovered though, and I gave an example before the first test, is there are some stubborn people who under any circumstances whatsoever will remain true to their ethics. And in the study that he did in the Stanford prison experiment, there was this one student, he was very conservative, he had a very authoritarian mindset, which mean, meant he followed rules always, but he had dedicated himself, he was a very conservative but very devout Christian, and he would not go along in some of the practices that they were carrying out in the prison because of his Christian convictions, and they couldn't break him. And this is, this is an example that he compares to the situation in the Nazi concentration camps where a lot of, especially devout Catholics, some Protestants, but more than, than, than Protestants, devout Catholics refused to submit to the terror that the Nazis had introduced in the concentration camps. And they stood up. And actually, when you resist and when you remain true to your morals, your chances of survival are actually higher, interestingly enough than people who just do anything to, to get along, to get by. Okay, but before we do that, I want to uh, bring up something because it's uh, very timely. Every semester is different, and this semester, NDU is passing its code of ethics. I actually requested that I can give this to the class and have you go through it as an exercise, but they told me uh, that's, uh, it's too early, it has to be passed by the university, and then we can use it. So once it's passed, I can give it to you. But what's the, um, what's the problematic side of telling the students they can see the code of eth ethics after it's passed? What's the problem there? They have no influence, they have no say. Now, if that's the case, which approach is not being followed. If you have an interest in something, what are you called? If you're affected by something, stakeholder. you're a stakeholder. So what's not happening is there's no stakeholder process. Now, this might cost me my job because this is going on tape, uh, but anyway, I think this is significant because in the transition from a situation we have at the current time, which is a traditional Lebanese university, sort of like the Lebanese university, to a Western-style um, 
for university with American or Western standards, uh, something like the stakeholder process will be, should be encouraged. So we'll see. I mean, again, where could you go to complain about this? To the student union. It's your elected representative body. Ask the student union why policies are being drafted this year, where the students are supposed to have an active say in uh, decision-making processes. Why are policies being drafted without the students' involvement? You are the stakeholders as much as the administration or the faculty. But what I can reveal to you are the topic areas, uh, which doesn't say much about uh, what's in them, but just to give you an idea, what's being covered by the ethics policy? One, okay, the definition, I'll read it to you. Uh, don't write it down, okay? Definition, uh, uh, or the rationale, excuse me. In line with NDU's mission as a Maronite Catholic University and a community of faith, the university is committed to high standards of respect and equity in personal conduct and actions. So what is the foundation of the ethics code at NDU? Okay. Faith, and within faith, Catholic faith, or Christian faith, excuse me, faith, Christian faith, Catholic faith, Maronite faith. So it's focusing in. So it's a faith-based institution. Uh, we have the term NGO, which means non-governmental organization. We also have a new term. It was introduced about 20 years ago, FBO, faith-based organizations. These are NGOs that are very clearly based on religious faith. So FBOs. So let's have a look now at what's in the Code of Ethics as far as the topics are concerned. What's the first topic? Conflict of interest. Have we had that already? Yes. Of course. I'll just read the definition. Conflict of interest refers to any business or personal relationship that may interfere with carrying out one's responsibilities with utmost objectivity. Can you think of an example of a clear conflict of interest? At, at NDU. Why would that be a conflict of interest? Okay, good. One example is using partisan political ties to give students favors. So, if you, if, in case you don't know it, I married into a Sunni family, and Sunnis are primarily mustakbal, right? So what if, I, if I would say in class, if, I'm not saying this, if I would say in class, if you're 14th of March, come to, me, come to office hours and we can work something out. And if you're 8th of, 8th of March, forget it. That would be a clear conflict of interest. So it's not, students, professors and students can't be neutral in a country like Lebanon, but you should not let your partisan interests influence your teaching or grading. Okay, second, confidentiality. Now watch what this says. Confidentiality, confidential information refers to sensitive or personal information that may be detrimental to the university or to one of its members if it is made public. So it is sensitive or personal information. Now that's a relatively vague uh, area and it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be interesting then to see how that is dealt with. Non-discrimination policy. Now what we should know is this policy is being passed because NDU is, as, is aspiring to, aspiring to accreditation with, uh, that's the engineers again, right? <laughs> who, who, <laughs> who are a lot further along with their ABLE accreditation than we are as a university with NIOSC. I mean, you're almost finished, as far as I know, right? And what did we do? We actually used, in the NIASC committees, we used the ABLE accreditation as a benchmark. What does benchmarking mean? How, what, what's the abbreviation? It's A-B-E-L? A-B-E-T. A-B-E-T, right. A-B-E-T. A-B-E-T accreditation standing for? Athletic 
American. Uh, uh, this, is, this is probably engineering, right? En that's engineering, okay, that's American. Anyway, the ABIT accreditation is accreditation for engineering faculties. And so what we did is we looked at what you guys were doing, because you're like two and a half years ahead of us, and we basically aspired to do the same thing. So this is a, called benchmarking. Benchmarking is also something you can do in ethical policy. Benchmarking basically means that I say, this is as good as it gets, and let's try to live up to that, and let's give ourselves time to do that. So we're in the lucky position uh, with, with, with ABIT accreditation to have somebody who's ahead of us that we can try to aspire. With LAU, I know this because I know, how, I know people who were part of the process there, it was the pharmacy department. Because the pharmacy department at LAU is not an American accredited institution, it is an American institution. It's a transplant. So they basically took the pharmacy department in LAU and used that as the role model or the benchmark. Okay, so non-discrimination. So what we did is we have schools of aspiration. By the way, guys, this is something you should be using in all areas. Uh, it, when your student representatives are in the committees, look what you're allowed to do as a student in our schools of aspiration. What does that mean if you're aspiring to do something? I mean, what, what, you're looking, no, aspiring is to try to, 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 to set a goal, set a goal to do something. So the schools of aspiration are the schools in the U.S., there's one in Lebanon, which is AUB, uh, that, Le that NDU has chosen as their role models, as their benchmarks. And so now let's look at and see what happens in the non-discrimination policy. First of all, non-discrimination policy, it's not a definition. The definition of discrimination for the purpose of this policy is any act or on or of off campus, on or off campus, or in cyberspace, so don't, don't uh, try to, uh, to mob people or bully people online, it's the same thing. By any NDU community member or affiliate, that's you guys too, by which an individual is treated less favorably because they have a particular identity. Now, here I'm just gonna read the, 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 the list. No discrimination is tolerated on the basis of gender, which is whether you're a man or a woman, Race, which is your black or white. Religion, obvious. National or ethnic identity. Marital status. Disability. Political affiliation, that would be 14th of March. Or sexual orientation. Boom. Should that be in there? No. Yes, no, yes, no. Well, I'll tell you the reason why it's in there, and to turn this off, I'll tell you the reason why it's in there, because we are using schools of aspiration in the U.S., and in the U.S., it's in there, in the Catholic schools. If it's not in there, in most Catholic schools, they'll have problems with donors, with funding. So it's a following the American model. Okay, and finally, harassment. Actually, it's, yes. No, the question is, uh, yeah, it's, an, it's an important issue. It's an important, guys, 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 wait. We're not gonna discuss this here. I just wanna point out, you're, you're right. I just wanna point out that it might be important to include the students in the stakeholder process because of the sensitivity of the issue. So, you're now warned, right? Okay. The final one, harassment policy, and here the harassment policy goes in many areas, but the most important one that's chosen uh, as, a, as a focus area is sexual harassment. So, definition, sexual harassment is defined as any unwelcome implicit or explicit, that means insinuating or saying it openly, verbal or physical sexual advances and or requests for sexual favors which may impact educational performance, employment, or professional Development. Now this is a very interesting topic, which has a lot to do with ethics, because one of the key issues 
uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to take the glasses off. One of the key issues is using power to coerce students. So in the future, if that happens, there will be repercussions, there will be consequences. The thing that I missed in here is who can, who can actually register a complaint in any of these areas? The victim. The victim can register a complaint or the supervisor can register a complaint. But what I don't see in here, and I'll be bringing this up in the University Council, who often in an organization sees something going wrong and goes and tells? What's that called? Whistleblowing. So, often policies have a whistleblowing clause which protects whistleblowers. There should be something in here that says if you're a whistleblower, because let's say you're not a victim. Let's say I, as a professor, see something going on. Let's say, for example, I see somebody, a professor, constantly giving good grades to students who are, who are a member of his party and also letting them cheat. And I see it happening consistently. But I'm not part of this, but I, I notice it's happening. I'm not his chair or his dean, but I see it happening. And I go squeal. I go blow the whistle. Now what happens? They'll go, yeah, so there should be a whistleblowing policy in whatever, whatever. I mean, this is something that should be thought through. Okay, good. So just so much, this just shows you how ethics is part of our lives here at this very moment. We haven't, we're discussing an ethics policy and the whole issue of whistleblowing and stakeholder process, which you learned about in class, is now becoming real. Okay, good. Zimbardo. Dr. Evil. So, I'd like you to read the article for Tuesday, and then, of course, the sad moment arrives where we don't have class for a long time, right? We miss a Thursday, and we miss a Tuesday. So, I don't know what you guys are going to do in that time. Use it constructively. Maybe you can read the chapters again, just to war whatever. Yeah. Read, it again. read it again and again. I mean, I, I know you're missing... You could be missing me in the, in the, during the vacation, of course. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, take out your readers. While you're taking out your readers, I just wanted to mention in the University Council, the University Council, which is the highest body in the university that it decides on things definitively, we discussed this class. Because the head of the computer center, who knows who's the head of the computer center? Fauzi Barud, he was in the U.S. for three weeks doing training on O-E-R. And he presented, he opened educational resources and C-C, which is Creative Commons, thank you. And he did a 45-minute presentation on his findings. Um, it was, it's amazing what, what, what's going on. I can't explain that now. I need 45 minutes, right? That's how long he needed. Uh, and I need longer because I like to talk a lot. So, uh, but what, what, he, what he pointed out was that uh, so there's several professors who are already part of OER. One of them, some of you might know, which is Professor Roger Hajar. Yeah. Uh, he's already doing, putting lectures up yeah, on uh, uh, astronomy. Yeah. So we're already part of this. And he also pointed out you know, that this class is sort of the, the guinea pig. Does everybody know what a guinea pig is? A test animal, right? So we're, you're, you're the animal that we're giving the pharmaceuticals to and see if you die or get better, right? Uh, so, so he pointed out, uh, and, and so there's a lot of interest now I mean, in this class because uh, we're the first ones who are trying it. So uh, I pointed out that we had no problem with discipline because of the camera, uh, and everybody thought that was true. So, good. So, does everybody have their book out now? Okay, let's turn to Zimbardo, the page, the, there, if, you, if, you, if you didn't read it yet, so I'll point it out to you. On page, uh, where is it, the list? On page 57, uh, which is 134 in the book. On page 57, in the reader, we have 10 steps to being an evil leader. So if your goal in life is to be a successful evil leader, 
you can now follow those 10 steps and you can succeed. Uh, you'll do that, okay? I'm, hope, hope, I'm hoping that one or two of you will try this out before the end of the semester and give us some feedback, right? So if you have, if you have any examples, uh, the one that's used in the book or in the article is Lord of the Flies. Has, has anybody read that novel? Yeah, okay, what's it about? Yeah. They fall in an island and yeah. they're living alone. And they tell us how once they were friends and how they became enemies just to save their own life. Yeah, okay. Is that is that picking up when she's speaking? Sort of, okay. Good. Okay. Uh, maybe we can get some more interaction in here. Okay. So but that's not the important <laughs> that's not the important point. What happens is that the boys become more and more radical and evil. And in the end, the ones who refuse to be evil are killed. So it's, it's describing in the, in the form of a novel how this process works. So if anybody wants to try that out at home in their free time, please do so we can get some feedback by the end of the semester. Okay, so the 10 steps are followed at the end of the book, or the end of the chapter, interestingly enough, by... On page 68, 156 in the actual chapter, about, with 11 steps, of antidotes. An antidote is a counterpoison. So I get a snake bite, which is a poison, and I take another poison to undo the poison of the snake, of the effects. So I don't know why he has 10 evil steps to be a successful evil leader, but, only, but he needs 11 to be unevil to undo it, but it's interesting, uh, you need more steps to be unevil than you do to be evil. So let's have a look at what he says, and let's try now to think about what we've read so far. Let's try to think of, from the other authors where we can find similar con conflict concepts uh, and categories or strategies for doing evil or not. And obviously the reason he's writing this chapter is not to teach us all how to be evil. It's to teach us what? Why? What's the purpose of him collecting this information and publishing it? Right, to prevent it. You're supposed to be, as a reader, you're supposed to be aware of how this works so that when you, when you see it starting to happen to you, you can at least know someone's messing with your mind. And then you can decide to go along or not, but you re you'll recognize this. This is very important uh, for people who are in uh, challenging situations to know that this is not happening to them alone for the first time, but this is a pattern of behavior which is probably worldwide and has been happening throughout human history. So the first one, offering an ideology that justifies any means to achieve seemingly desirable, a seemingly desirable goal. So. What is an ideology, before we move on? It's a way of thinking. It's an ology. It's, it means it's probably scientific or has some sort of uh, systematic uh, attributes to it. it, it it's, it's logical. There are steps. And it's oft, another word is, that is often used is a world view, a, a way of seeing everything. An ideology can be used to explain everything that comes up. So, if I offer an ideology, for example, that my religion is the only true religion, and everybody else's religion is an affront, is, a, is, a, is, a, is actually is, is blaspheming God, and I have a goal in, or a mission in life, which is to uh, force people to follow my religion, and if they refuse, either drive them out, if I'm nice, or kill them, that would be a, something that the Germans used to do uh, very effectively during the 30, 30, I'm avoiding that at the moment, during the 30 Years' War. Germany had a war for 30 years, which, which, it, which ended in the 17th century, it's a long time ago, where the Protestants and the Catholics went at each other over this issue of religion. What they ended up with was the, with the, was the result of the, of the Treaty of Westphalia, 
which basically, you don't have to know this, but just this is an example, which said that the people had to have the same religion as their ruler. So if your baron or your duke or your prince was Catholic, everybody in that country had to be Catholic. And if he was Protestant, everybody in that country had to be Protestant. So they had two choices, convert or leave. And so there's a lot of population shifting at that time for people who refused to become Catholic or refused to become Protestant. So that would be one justification, religion. What else it would justify uh, doing anything for a cause? Race. race, OK, race, racism. There's no such thing as human races. Race, in a technical uh, use, is if you take two animals, in this case, or you could take plants too, take, take two animals, you breed them. If the offspring is not f f fertile, they cannot have children, they're two different races. So if you take a donkey and you take a horse and breed them, what do you get? A, uh, a mule. A mule, right? And mules look very unhappy because, you know, they can't get no... Uh, and so, uh, obviously horses and donkeys are not the same race. How about if you take a Lebanese and a Japanese? Some soft music, a bottle of wine. Nine months later, will the child be able to have children? Yes, yes. so Lebanese and Japanese and, and Kenyans and Norwegians are all the same race, but there is something called race-ism, which is an ideology, which is assuming that there are very distinct differences between races. What we know is that that's not true, that if you take the, the, the spectrum of difference within Africa, there are bigger differences within the African race, if you will, than between the Northern Africans and the Southern Europeans. And the same thing, if you take the Southern Europeans and look at the Northern Europeans, there are bigger differences between them than the Europeans and the Asians. So there's no such thing as an Asian race, and in the US they have an interesting policy that in the census, when they count people every 10 years, you have to declare your race, and one of the races is Hispanic, which means Spanish speaking. Spanish speaking is not a, is a, is not a biological race. A language cannot be a race group. But it's a, so these are actually cultural groups or backgrounds. In any case, racism assumes that people who have white skin, usually racism is of European origin, now, did I tell you the story of, of South Africa? Yes. The Lebanese when they went to South Africa? No. Yes? Okay, who, who said yes? No. Well, you want to hear it again? Oh, let him tell us. Okay. So, are, are Lebanese white? Or are they colored? In South Africa, up until about 15 years ago, they had a system called apartheid. We'll be reading about that later on. Apartheid. We didn't talk about this yet? No, we didn't. Okay. So when the Lebanese, before World War I, migrated to South Africa, and Lebanese were migrating in huge numbers uh, before World War I. One of the major reasons for young men to leave the Ottoman Empire before World War I was in order to not have to serve in the army because it was a very long period, extended 8, 12 years. Uh, so a lot of people were leaving for America. If they couldn't go to the US, they maybe went to South America, Australia, South Africa. And when they got there, they were categorized not as black, what that would be of African sub-Sahara origin, but also not as white, because they were, from the Ottoman Empire, they were categorized, uh, categorized as Turks, and they were colored. Colored was either Asian, Chinese, Indian, or mixed race, and Swede, and an African. So the Lebanese said, that's not good. And they looked around, this, is, this has been documented through court uh, records. We, at the Lebanese Emigration Research Center, you can get the article. Uh, they looked around and they saw that the uh, Palestinian Jews, who were also from the Ottoman Empire, were considered white. And the rationale was that Jesus is the son of God, right? So he can't be black or colored, he has to be white because, you know, we good Dutch Christians wouldn't pray to a non-white God, right? So they made, if Jesus is white, then his people, who are the Palestinian Jews, 
are also white. That's, that's logical. And so the Lebanese thought, you know, how can we do that ourselves? And they realized that there's, you can define people by their, r their religion, which would be Jewish, or by their language. And they said, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Some of you saw the Passion of the Christ. It's in Aramaic, which is the same as Syriac, right? So they said, it's the same language. It's, you can understand it. It's like Norwegian and Swedish, right? So, uh, uh, so they said, look, we speak Jesus' language. We are the people of Jesus. And if Jesus was white, we're white too. And so the courts declared the Lebanese Christians to be white. The Lebanese Muslims remained colored. That shows, <laughs> which shows you how scientific racism is, right? Uh, just to make the point. So racism, another form of discrimination or, or of, of an ide ideology of superiority is language group. Wh which conflicts, which are very violent at the moment, can you think of where the language group is decided? Not, not skin color, like in the US or South Africa. Yes. Not religion, like in Bosnia or, or Nigeria or Lebanon, but language. Canada was at a point that was an issue. How about Crimea or Ukraine? That's the issue. Russian, Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking. So I can have an ideology of the superiority of my language group, et cetera, et cetera. One way of getting people, and now it's very easy. How does it work? You want to start a civil war? You have a Christian village and you have a Muslim village. I want, I want to start a civil war. So I start some propaganda and say the other group is horrible, blah, 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 and get people all upset. We go to a couple of basketball games and beat people up. And then one night we go to the bar and blow up the bar in the other town. And now what, what do we hope will happen? That they will come and blow up a bar in, in my town. Why do I want the other side to blow up a bar in my town? Because then everybody in my town will look for a leader to protect them. And guess who that is? Me, right. That's how, and then the other guy, the, the guy on the other side, and we can talk, we can phone, you know, so hey, uh, I just blew up your bar, now come over. And there, there have been cases of that actually happening, of the leaders on both sides trying to ratchet it up. Right, okay. So, this works very well, and this ideology is hard to fight. It's easy to start, very difficult to stop. As we can see in the situation in Syria, what is going to happen when that war is over. No one knows. But what they're going to do is find a lot of mass graves and some of horrible stories that we don't even know about yet. So how is that ever going to heal? Anyway, point one. Zimbardo says, you want to be an evil leader? There you go, point one. Point two, when you're getting people to join your evil side, have some sort of a contractual agreement. Something that, uh, for example, the way, one of the ways that both spy organizations, secret services, if, if I want to uh, recruit you to be a spy for my country, and I'm a, I'm a member of the CIA or Mossad or what used to be the KGB, one of the MI5, one of the things I'll do, I'll study people who I want to recruit and see if they have any financial difficulties or any health issues in their family. If somebody can't pay the mortgage on their house because their child is sick and they're spending all their money for their child's health care, what will I do? I'll pay for that. And in return, uh, some small document here or there. And then, so contractual agreements of some kind or other that make you feel responsible. They can be verbal or written. Third, give participants meaningful roles to play. If you remember in the Milgram experiment, the people who were turning up the current, they thought that they were doing an important job. We are helping to solve major difficulties in learning. We, you are part of an, ama an amazing process to serve the good. So give them something and make their roles seem important, even if it's not. Make them feel important, because if they feel important, they'll, do they'll do more. And they'll feel, they'll feel empowered. What does that mean? To empower somebody is to make them feel that they are part of the team and their contribution is really important. Without me, this wouldn't work. So when they think of quitting, they're going to go, I would really want to quit now, but without me, it won't work. So I better stick to it. Okay, three, 
presenting basic rules to be followed that seem to make sense prior to the actual use, but then can be arbitrarily used to justify mindless compliance. Make the rules vague and change them as necessary. It's important to make people go against the, their logic. Make some very vague rules uh, and then change them. Say, for example, I love this example, that the only real way to, to set up a government is a two-thirds majority in parliament because that's the way we used to do it in the millet system. I actually thought this was, I was convinced that the people on both sides were telling the truth. So the millet system is what? It goes back to the Arabs before the Ottomans, which says that each group should rule itself, right? So we have to have all the groups participating, which means we need, you know, 60, 70 percent of the population involved in any decision. This is, the, this is the Lebanese way, and it's probably a good way to do things in a very complex society. So that leads us to the two-thirds majority concept. Then there's the 50 plus one majority, which is the system that we acquired from France and the US. So if you want to be a modern country, with a modern democracy, let's get rid of this old Ottoman Arab thing and let's do the modern French American thing. So, remember how that remember how that used to be? Who was on which side? And then overnight flip. Did the did the supporters of both sides rebel and say, "No way. You <laughs> we can't change our minds." And we we did they did they stick with their values or did they follow their leaders? They followed the leaders, all of them. Did you see one group where the members rebelled when that position? Because now it's the other way, right? So what this is teaching us is that these rules have to be vague and you have to be able to shift them. So already you can see somebody's, if somebody, if they, imagine they switch back to two thirds and 50 plus one. What would happen? Well, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. No, the other way around. <laughs> so, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So if they switch back, then everybody's going to go, hey, we're not going to follow them twice. They follow They'll follow them again. OK, good. Altering the semantics of the act, the actor, and the action. Replace reality with desirable rhetoric. Um, for example, you don't, these are called euphemisms. These are words that make things sound better than they are. We don't talk about problems anymore. We talk about challenges. But actually, we do have problems, right? I mean, what, 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 giving it a different name, what does that actually? Uh, so it, I mean, there are, there are good reasons for changing labels. When the label is discriminatory, for example, it's summer now, so I don't have a cap. Oh, you have a cap. Can you bring your cap over here? So I'm not going to put it on, don't worry. So if I, if when the class is over, if I stand there with my cap, and as you walk out, I stand like this, what do I expect? Money. Money. So here you go. So why do we call people with disabilities handicap? Why do we call people with disabilities beggars? Because, because in the 19th, they used to be beggars. In the 19th century, in the period of, a, of rapid industrialization, there was no welfare state. So when people came to the cities and no one was there to help them, and they had an industrial accident or they went to war and came back injured and they couldn't work, they had to beg. And so the disability became equated with poverty, with begging. That's why, of course, people who are disabled don't like to be called handicapped. But they also don't like to be called disabled. They like to be called people with disabilities. Why? Because there's a disability that's happening to them. Who makes the decision to make it impossible to get into this room except by walking down the stairs? Or you have to go all the way around. Who, who, who makes the structural barriers for wheelchairs at this university? The, the, the design. design. The, disabil the, the disabilities are created by somebody, some barrel maker, right? If you will. So sometimes changing names is, is a good thing. Eskimos don't call themselves Eskimos. 
They call themselves Inuit. Druze don't call themselves Druze. They call themselves, and I keep on forgetting. <laughs> Does anybody know what the Druze call themselves? What? what? Mahadun, right. So there are good causes, there are good justifications for changing terms. But in many cases, we just change the names to make, it, make something bad look better. Look better. So that's a, that's a common strategy uh, that we saw, for example, in the, in the uh, novel 1984, uh, that the, the Ministry of War was called the Ministry of Peace. But if you look at documents from World War I, most countries had a ministry of war. Today they have a ministry of defense. Why? They stopped going to war? <laughs> it sounds better, right? You know, because the assumption is, I will never attack somebody else. I will only be defending myself. So these are the kinds of things he's talking about. Creating opportunities. This is very important for diffusion of responsibility or suggesting that others will re be responsible or that the actor will not be held re uh, 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 liable. Right. In World War II, or under the Nazi regime, for a long time people thought, well, we're going to win, so I can, do, I can go along with these horrible things because we're going to win. Right. Uh, when it became clear that they, were not, they might not win, people were looking for ways of blaming somebody else. It's very important to say when you're doing these things, look, this is a scientific experiment, you're covered. If something goes wrong, you won't have to pay. So find mechanisms to make people feel secure that they will not have to pay the price if something goes wrong. Uh, you can say, well, I mean, obviously, if we take the, 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 the case of rape, who usually gets blamed? The woman. The woman. Why do we never ask which clothing the rapist had on? Why is his, yeah, so because she, uh, yeah, because she provoked him, right? His clothing is not, a, is not relevant, right? If he can't control himself, he should put a bag over his head. Uh, maybe we should propose that, bags for rapists, right? They can't see anymore, so they don't know who, be a real veil of ignorance, right? Uh, so you put the blame on the victim. This is a classical way of diffusion putting the blame on the victim instead of the perpetrator. Okay. Uh, seven, starting the path toward the ultimate evil act with something small, like 15 volts. Uh, something small can also be a contractual agreement. We know this from the mafia movies. Uh, once you sign up for the mafia, you get what you need. You know, your kid can go to college or whatever. But then you have to do what? You have to go kill someone or you have to go rob a bank. Why? So, so now you can't get out, right? I used to work as a security guard. I know Patrick's uh, security in and out. I, used to, I worked for a security guard in Munich for eight years. And what we used to do, I'm not proud of this, but when there were two of us, we would say, why are we staying here all night together? Why doesn't one person go home early, right? So, trick. When, you're, when two of you start to work at a shift and no one's gonna know it if one person goes home early, tell the other guy to go home early first and tomorrow I'll go home early. Why? Because then, then he can't squeal on you, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine you go home early and he calls up and says, hey, Maria's not here anymore. I'm, I don't know why, she just went home, right? Uh, so let him go home early. So, but what you're, <laughs> what you're doing here is your little steps will allow you to get used to it, and then, next step, gradually increase the steps, gradually increase steps on the pathway to abuse, you know, upping it slowly. We know the comparison of the frog and the boiling water, right? You, you take a pan with boiling water, you throw a frog in it, what it'll do, it'll jump out. You put a frog in cold water, turn the heat up real gradual, it'll stay in there and boil because it won't notice because it's so slow. You do the same thing with evil, get them used to it. So let's say I'm running a large restaurant and you're working for me now and I want you to use food, meat for example, that has expired. So you're going to go, would I give you like this big thing that if, if we serve this 10 people will die? Is that the first thing you have to do? No, do something small. Like, you know, let's put a little bit of that meat in with the, with the tabbouleh, right? not even with the, uh, what's it called, kibbeh. We're mixing up the meat for the kibbeh, it's got bulgur, it's got meat. We got 
let's put like 5% spoiled meat in there. No one's going to notice. Next week, let's put 10% spoiled meat in there. Just up it slowly. They get used to it, right? And then by the, by the time someone dies, <laughs> by the time someone dies, we're all in this together. Okay. Changing the, na the nature of the influence to uh, changing the nature of the influence authority from initially just and reasonable to unjust and demanding, which elicit and demanding which elicits confusion but continued obedience. This is so somewhat similar to the previous one. Why do you want to get people to follow you when you change the rules, when you're, what you're doing is unjust? Because in the end, they have to follow you blindly. My favorite example was in the Third Reich, who's Aryan and who's not? No, Aryan. A I know, I know how to spell Aryan. Okay, Aryan, okay. Aryan, who's Aryan and who's not? Aryan is somebody who is from the Caucasus. That's where the word Iran comes from, not Iran, Iran. Iran. Caucasus, Aryan, right? So there is this racist baloney, it's a false science, that the Aryan race is a pure race and it's the best race on superior, right? So when Hitler set up his Third Reich, he had to decide, okay, obviously the Germans are Aryan, but who else? Who else is Aryan? Austrians are Germans, German speaking. Who else could be Aryan? How about the Dutch? They're Germ Germanic, yeah. How about the Swedes? Yeah, they're, they're Aryan, good. They're, so the, all, the Germ all the people who speak Germanic languages, Norway, Sweden, Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, and wait a second, and the Germans, the Austrians, the Dutch, they're all Aryan. How about the French? They decided that they're Aryan too. But now the difficult one, how about the Italians? No way. Southern Italians, Aryan, they look more like North Africans. They can't be Aryan. But unfortunately, Italy is allied with Germany. Germany. Mussolini has an has a agreement. The Third Reich was part of the Axis. So Italians were declared Aryan. In Yugoslavia, the Slovenes, the Croats, and the Serbs made up Yugoslavia. The, the Slovenes and the Croats became Aryan, and the Serbs were not Aryan. The Poles were not Aryan. Obviously, the Russians aren't Aryan. But in 1943, the US has succeeded so enough in the, in the bombing war and taking most, most parts of southern Italy and there's a coup in Italy, and the Italian government is overthrown, Mussolini is arrested, and they ally themselves with the US. And overnight, the Italians stop being Aryan. Imagine that. So you wake up, and you're, 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 you're a boss, you have a construction company, your workers are divided into Aryan and non-Aryan, uh, and now, foreign workers, and now all of a sudden the Italians are Switch sides, they're not, they're not Aryan anymore. So you have to explain that. It doesn't matter. People get used to following orders blindly if you train them well. Okay, did you get the point? It was very interesting to see the documents, how they tried to quickly turn the Italians into non Aryan. Okay, change. Okay, good. And finally, making the exit costs high by allowing the usual forms of verbal dissent while insisting on behavioral compliance. Okay. What does that mean? Why are people encouraged to s say small things about the situation that, that is very oppressive, but they have to continue acting in compliance? Why do people have to continu continue to obey an evil leader, but why are they allowed to sometimes complain a bit? But they don't feel that, okay, to give them a feeling, it's part of empowering them. One of the things, if you look at the documents, one of the things that was happening towards the end of the Third Reich, a lot of things were going wrong. People were becoming very unhappy. The war, they were losing the war. When you lose a war, your economy starts going down. People were complaining. Corruption was going up. 
they encouraged the German people in Nazi Germany to complain about these issues like lack of food, lack of heating, to give them a feeling that they care. They care. And what most people, when you, in, when you interviewed them after the war, they said, you know, we were convinced that all the problems were being caused by the middle level officials, because those are the ones that they were interacting with, but Hitler himself, if he only knew what was going on, he would stop it. So they would try to tell Hitler, you know, they, they would send letters saying that this and that is going wrong with the heating or with supply of milk or children's clothing or whatever, assuming that if Hitler would ever find out, he would, he would care, right? So you have to continue obeying, but small issues, but changing sides, opting out is not an option. We all know if you compare this to the Nazi, the Nazis to, the, to the, uh, the mafia, once you join the mafia, there's nowhere out. There's no way out. You want to leave the mafia? There's one way in the grave. Okay. So, what we discover, he, I mean, these, these, these 10 points sound logical, but he basically distilled them over many years doing applied empirical research. He did many, many case studies or many experiment, experimental situations to, to, figuring out, to figure out how this works. One of the things that he discovered were statistical outliers, now we all know what that means, right? That was on the test. So, what is a statistical outlier? It's, it, it, it's so exceptional that it's, it's, that it's not, a, you, they, they will be ignored. What did Zimbardo do with his statistical outliers? He didn't ignore them. He thought it was interesting that in very, very rare cases, people actually refused. 80 percent, 90 percent go along, which is horrible, but the question is why are 10 percent not going along? Why are even sometimes 15 or 20 percent not going along? So what he did in the second phase of, One. mainly when he got older, actually when you retire you try to, before you die you try to do something good, right? Uh, uh, he, he's now focused, he has, he has a project on heroism, on ethical heroism. Um, and he has, by the way, he has offered NDU. So I'm, this is an offer st still standing. We did a uh, teleconference with him a couple years ago. And he offered us and our students, that means you, to, to work with him on this project on heroism. What he wants to do, once he finds out, or what he did find out, that there are basic attributes to people who heroically stand up to the pressure. So what, is, what he's now dedicated his life to, in the last couple years of his life, he's in his 80s, is to encourage heroic ethical resistance. So we'll get into that a little bit later, but let's look at the 11 points that he offers us. And we saw some parallels to the other authors in the first section. Now let's look for parallels in the second section. The 11 steps that we can take to resist evil traps. Okay, the first thing you have to know is there are evil traps. Once you realize that you're about to fall into one, or you have fallen into one, or more than one, because normally these evil traps come in bunches and groups, what can you do to run counter to this, is to strengthen yourself against this kind of pressure. Okay, on page 68, 156 in the book. Openly acknowledge errors in judgment. This reduces the need to justify mistakes and continue immoral action. It undercuts the motivation to reduce dissonance by reaffirming a bad decision. For example, who was the one who looked up, who, who looked up on Google how to write outlier? That was you, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not dis, I'm not dyslexic. I'm left-handed. And what happens with left-handed people who are forced to write with their right hand? They have the same symptoms as dyslexia. Because if you're, left, if you're right-handed, your, your logical center is on the left. So we always say people should have more should be more in tune with the right side of their brain. If you're left-handed, 
the, it's the other way around, right? So, so, <laughs> so if you're left-handed, but are, because back in the, in the 50s when I learned how to, there was no such thing as left-handed. It was considered a disability. <laughs> so you had to train children out of it. So uh, what you get is sort of a switching. So I don't know how to spell very well. I admit that. So let's say I make a mistake in my lecture. What would an authoritarian evil leader do? He'd make you believe it. I'm, I'm right because I'm the boss. The thing is, that when I make a mistake and I don't admit it, I have to continue along making the same mistake to keep it credible. Let's say I make a mistake in spelling or with a date or whatever, uh, and I admit it. What happens then? What, what happens to my authority? Will be shaken. Well, it depends what, what the mistake was, right? If it's a mistake in a date or in spelling, and I say, oh, my goodness, I spelled that wrong, or that's the wrong date. Do you now think, well, I'm not going to believe him anymore. He just made a mistake. No. Or I admit the mistake. Who would you tend to believe more, the person who admits mistakes or the person who doesn't? Admits. admits. Because unless it's something really, really shameful, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes. People do it all the time. So this actually not only increases the credibility of the, of the author, of the leader, it also encourages the same behavior in everybody else. You lead by example. So in organizations, the followers will be as empowered as the leader to m admit mistakes. Because often admitting a mistake is seen as a sign of weakness. But it is actually a sign of strength. So this creates a, uh, an environment in an organization where making a mistake is nothing wrong, is not bad, and you don't have to force people to follow you uh, in your own mistakes. Encourage mindfulness. We had, that, we had that concept before, but we used another term. Mindfulness means I do what I'm thinking I want to do, or I think what I want to do. What's that term? Intentionality. Intentionality. Bravo. Mindfulness is the same thing as intentionality. I was a vegetarian for three years, and I was also a bike racer. It's the, it's the, I would say the, the worst sport that I can, I can remember, like the most grueling, harshest sport is wrestling. It, it's a killer, right? But the second one is bike racing. This is not? But it's very hard. You're a wrestler? No, it's not. F it's fun, but it's really, really, it's like, it's like six minutes of hell, right? Uh, the second most grueling one is bike racing. Can you be a vegetarian and race and, and, and do a, a really tough sport? You have to be very intentional. You can't just go and get a slab of meat, bah, right? That'll take care of all your needs, right? And because you're doing sports, you'll burn it off, right? If you're a vegetarian and you do really intense sports, you have to think every single day about what you're going to eat. Does being intentional or mindful in one area will cause you to be intentional or mindful in other areas. And if it's something as central to your life as food, it will have a huge impact on what you eat. If you want to change around your life, you say, I don't like the way my life is being run by others or whatever, go vegan and see what happens. Use no animal products, including leather and see how your life changes. You will be incredibly mindful all of a sudden. Everything you do now, you'll be aware of. It's a fun exercise. Try it for, a, try it for two weeks. Why did you stop? Uh, OK, we have a couple of minutes. I stopped. I, 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 the reason I did it was this back in the 70s when we had this, no, it wasn't hippie. It was, it was post-hippie. Uh, it was, in the, back in the 70s, what became very obvious was that they were destroying the rainforests around the world to grow soy beans to make beef. The, the, the ratio between beef protein and grain or bean protein is 21 to 1. So you can either eat it 1 to 1, or you can eat it through a cow, which is 21 to 1, which is a huge waste. Why do we have to eat beef? It's, beef is one of the most special, it's a specialty. It's something that only very rich people used to eat, like shrimp. <laughs> or salmon. Why can you go to shrimpy? You know, I mean, why can you eat shrimpy hamburgers, right? 
This is, these are, these are, when, when that happens, you have to realize how the food's being produced. Nutrition, nutrition students. So for this region, it was political. The idea that we have to reduce our consumption, especially in Western Europe and North America. Then I went to the third world for the first time. I went to Mexico and I couldn't get any vegetarian food because everything had some lard in it, some, the, the grease from the pig or something. Everything had, so I went to a five-star restaurant so I could have a vegetarian meal. And I thought, this is not, this is not logical. And I'm sitting in a five-star restaurant with the super rich <laughs> out of solidarity with the poor. So I stopped after three years. It was, it was political to start, it was political to stop. It wasn't hell, anyway. So, third, promote a sense of personal responsibility and accountability for all of one's actions. We all know this. You do something wrong and you want to blame it on others, right? It wasn't, either I didn't do it, someone else did it, or someone, someone told me I had to do it, right? Now, we all know in the Bible and the Quran, it says on Judgment Day, when you're going to be judged on the final day of judgment, you can blame it on your teacher, your mother, or your priest, right? No, you can't? You can't, right, obviously. So do that on earth during your present life. Always take responsibility for your actions. And if you do that, when you, when you go into a situation knowing that, and if, if the boss does it, if the leader does it, what's he going to do? What's the, what are the followers going to do? They're going to follow suit. Followers are also going to start living up to their responsibilities. So, so encourage, uh, promote personal responsibility. Fourth one. The fourth one reminds me of a theory we had on the test. What is it? Distinct, wait, discourage minor transgressions. Minor transgression means something. The, the, oh, she's already doing it. She's already breaking the window with her stone that she's got. She's an imaginary stone. The broken windows theory. The broken windows theory has not only been proven experimentally to be correct, it has been proven in real life. Mayor Giuliano, who was the mayor during 9-11, by the way, uh, when he became uh, mayor of New York, New York was bankrupt. That means they couldn't pay their debt and they had one of the highest crime rates in the world. He was able to turn that city around ver for various reasons, better budgeting and that kind of thing, but as far as crime is concerned, he was the first mayor of a major city in the world to introduce the broken windows theory into praxis, which meant that anybody who was caught committing minor crimes was not let off with a warning or they, were, they, were, they went after even people like, I gave you the example on Thursday, I believe, of jumping the turnstile. If you've ever been in, in Europe or North America in the metro, there's, there's something where you have to walk through and it turns. So what do people do? They jump over it. <laughs> they, they run through, pew, jump over it, and they just get on the train for free, right? So stop them, catch them. A person who does that is probably likely also to be a shoplifter, to go into stores and steal food. Somebody who jumps over turnstiles and steals stuff in stores is also likely to steal cars. And somebody who does those three things is also likely to be an, a violent criminal, and he might you know, steal people with a gun or a, gu or a knife, rob a bank. And somebody who robs, you know, see how it goes? And so what he did, they found a lot of offenders, people who had been, who, they'd been looking for them for a while, they caught them because they jumped a turnstile, or drugs. Or, or, what it also did, it created a, uh, an environment in the metro, in the subway, on the streets, where people realized somebody cares about this street. Somebody cares about this neighborhood. Uh, if somebody cares about this neighborhood, and if I commit a crime in this neighborhood, somebody's going to see me, and then I'll get caught. So the broken windows theory is what, probably one of the, the theories where you see a really close link between experimentation, but first of all, speculation, what if? What if, we, what if we would make everything look tidy? Would people start becoming more law-abiding? Law then you test it with experiments, and then you put it into practice, and it, and it worked. Okay. Uh, th that, of course, is a very good argument. Next time you complain about people not obeying the traffic rules, and somebody says, don't we have bigger problems in this country than smoking or photocopying textbooks or parking within the lines? Shouldn't we work on the big problems first? Now you can say, 
Well, the broken windows theory proves to us, and then <laughs> go, wh go whatever, right? Yeah, go break a window, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Distinguish, be <laughs> distinguish between just and unjust authority. This is a key one. What is the difference? I hear some humming in the room. What is the difference between authoritarian and authoritative? What's the difference? Okay. Uh, Sara, is that wall blue? You better say it is, otherwise you're going to get an F. Is that wall blue? Okay, F. Is that wall blue? C? Now it's blue. A plus. Is that wall blue? Still, oh, she's one of those 10% who's heroic. <laughs> she's going to go to her death <laughs> just because she won't admit that the wall's blue. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to stand, stand up for your rights? Is the wall orange? Is the wall orange? Yeah, no. Of course it's orange. It's orange. it's orange, can't you see? The wall's orange. So, authoritarian, authoritarian behavior assumes that you follow the leader because of the leader's position. When you criticize the president in Lebanon, for example, you write, you post jokes about the president on Facebook. What might happen to you? Or what did happen to some people? They were arrested. Yeah, you're not allowed, is it because of that person felt offended? No, it's because you are challenging or offending the position of the presidency. You're not offending the president, you're offending the presidency, the position. The same thing goes for ministers or top generals or top religious leaders. You're, you're offending the position, not the person. So, I'm an associate professor at NDU, senior faculty member. Is that wall blue? <laughs> Hello, say it's blue. <laughs> so what am I doing? I'm exercising an authoritarian right. My position gives me the right to tell you which color the wall is, and your eyes are irrelevant. Okay, you get it? Authoritative, on the other hand, is not based on position, but on merit. Now, don't say I'm French educated, I don't know what merit means. <laughs> what, what does merit mean? He just translated into French, right? Thank you. Okay, merit has to be earned, but how do you judge someone's merit? The two things go into making up merit. Well, you said you have to earn it, which is performance. What did he do? Performance. But you can't, you don't just look at somebody and say, I'll, everybody's equal, now I'm going to let them perform. You look at their record. So, it's performance plus experience. Merit. Performance plus experience. Can these two be quantified? What does that mean? Can these two, can performance and experience be quantified? No, it's not. Performance, yes. Experience, yes. Why? How many, how many languages does he know? How much foreign experience does he have working in, outside the country? How many degrees does he have? What's his GPA? That's experience. Work experience. What are, what, are the, what are the recommendations he got from his previous employers? This is all experience. This can be quantified. Normally when you hire people to positions, they give you points. So much points for languages, so much points for work experience, so much points for this, and so much points for that. It's quantifiable. And performance, you get a three-month grace period. They hire you on probation, and they look at your performance. Yeah, and after three months, they say, okay, the guy had a lot of experience, but some, he must have cheated because he's not any good at all, right? Or this person's past experience was not that impressive, but wow, look what she did. No, then hire her anyway, right? So you put the two together in a composite, 
and then you judge people, and that gives you authority based on merit instead of authority based on position. In the US, let's take the current president, Barack Hussein Obama. Now give me a break. He's got to be Al-Qaeda, right? Hussein? Either, uh, it's either Al-Qaeda or, or Hezbollah, one of the two, right? I mean, with the guy. Uh, so if I would go around saying, Barack Hussein Obama is not even American, he was born in Kenya, and he's a Muslim terrorist, and therefore is unsuit to be in the, suitable to be in the White House, would anything happen to me in the U.S.? No. Nothing. No. Nothing. Because the presidency in the U.S., is not protected because if you would give the presidency rights, he could use those rights to crush the opposition. So basically, as your position goes up in society, your protection against defamation goes down. And the principle is that someone who is a public figure does this voluntarily. I don't choose, I'm not forced to be the head of a religious institution or a general. No one said, hey, Sarah, you want to be a general? If not, I'm going to punish you. But if you can be a general, the president, or a minister, choose one. But you have to choose one. No one forces people to be leaders. They choose leadership themselves. They put themselves in that position, but they have to realize that your protection now. If I go and say, Sarah, uh, I saw her out yet last night robbing a bank. You could probably sue me for that. It's defamation. But if you're president, and I say, you're a horrible president, why did we ever vote for her? The presidency has been ruined forever because of her, whatever. In, in, Le in Lebanon, I'd go to jail. In the US, everyone would go, huh. Eh. Hear that every day, right? So, so here what he's saying is distinguish between just and unjust authority. Authority based on position is unjust, or can, normally can be unjust. Authority based on merit is just, because I have to constantly prove myself. I have to earn it every day. So, uh, reward moral behavior. More recognition needs to be available for those who do the right thing. This is why you need a whistleblower policy. We have to have whistleblower day. <laughs> Give them, give them two parking spots and they can park their car on, in the middle of the line for, for, for a month as a reward, right? Whatever. Reward people who stand up and speak truth to power. Make them the heroes. Okay. Respect human diversity. Okay. Appreciating difference is a key to reducing in-group bias. The very first trap on the list of 10 was ideologies which prove my group is better. We now have a term in English. Well, by the way, what is, what is using uppercase and lowercase, um, what does that signify or indicate in English? No, no. If I say I'm a Democrat with a small d, that means I support the concept of democracy. If I'm a Democrat with a capital D, that means I'm the member of the Democratic Party. If I'm Irish and I say I'm Republican, that means I support Irish independence. But I've used with a small r. With a capital R, it remembers I'm a member of the Republican, the Republican Party of Ireland, the Independence Party. In the US, it would be the Conservative Party. But with a small r, it just means I support republic as opposed to monarchy. So when we talk about other with a capital O, just to make the point, uh, that is, and we can also talk about othering. There's a, there's a, it's an activity. It's creating the other side as something that's outside of who we are. So this is very common. I mean, I enjoy this. I enjoy going between the different uh, Lebanese groups because I've, uh, um, I spend my days in, well, I, I used to live in Ras Beirut, so I spent my days in Sunni Ras Beirut, and I worked in Maronite Kisarwain. And I went back and forth every day. So that was always interesting. 
Those are two different realities. I have lots of, we, went, we went to our, with our students from the political science department, we went to do some training for a full day in Dahia, in Haratreik, of all places. Imagine some of the discussions we had before we went there. Some, uh, some, some, some people asked me to call up their parents and talk to them and say, so when they went down there, what did they discover? Nothing. Nothing. They, they discovered nothing. Actually, they discovered where we went is a very interesting, if you're interested, it's an organization called UMAM, which means nations. UMAM, um, um. sorry about um. that. UMAM, yeah. Um. Google it. Um. Put, put UMAM. And your mom, my mom, umam, okay. And put umam Beirut. They have, they have the most amazing center in Dahia because the owner uh, of this area is named Slim. He's Shia. Before the war, who lived in what is now called Dahia? Christians. It was a bunch of Christian villages. Why did they leave? Because of the war. What if you were Shia and lived in... Dahia. Did you leave? You stayed. There's only one farm left in Dahia, an actual farm. And that's where Umam is, right? So they not only discovered that Haratreik is not any different than a lot of other parts of Lebanon, they also discovered, they discovered this is a really cool place. And now they've all come back with these positive associations with Haratreik that everyone thinks they're great. Okay, good.